Okay, so here's the first rule. Modus ponens. There's seldomly any occasion where I ask you to sort of memorize something. And I suppose you don't have to do it in this occasion, but you will have to know the name modus ponens. But I don't think you have to memorize this. I think if you just kind of uh, work with it enough, you'll eventually get the name. Now, modus ponens is Latin for something that's slightly longer, modus ponendo ponens, which means literally the mode of argument that asserts by asserting. You don't have to know this bit, just know the name and the structure. Well, what's the structure? Well, here we have, say, premise one, we have phi entails or phi conditional psi. Premise two, we have, excuse me, we have phi, and then we conclude, therefore, psi. I mean, this makes sense. We do this stuff all the time. If it is raining, then the sidewalk is wet. Then we look outside, we see it's raining. Then we say, oh, well, the sidewalk must be wet. That's the first inferential rule, modus ponens. Okay, now notice that when we apply modus ponens, it could also be with antecedents and consequences or consequence that are of a molecular form. So taking a look at this blue box, we can see P or Q when tells S and R. We assert P or Q, and then we can assert the consequent of premise one, which is S and R. Yeah, and that's why I've used these Greek letters here. They could be really anything. It doesn't have to be an atomic. It could be a complex thing. Okay. Here is another example. P entails Q, P therefore Q. One more example for you. Logic is often about examples. If Sally is going to the mall, then Edmund will go to the mall. Sally is going to the mall, therefore Edmund will go to the mall. Easy. Now, of course, this is about validity, uh, not about soundness. It's possible that these premises are false. I don't know. I mean, I don't even know who Sally is, nor Edmund. Here is a visual representation of modus ponens. Sometimes this is really helpful to students. So, or perhaps I should say it's a visual representation of P entails Q. So if you know this is true, then you can diagrammatically represent it in this Venn-like diagram. This says, if you're in P, then you have Q. And it also says there are no other instances of P. Why? Because if the conditional is true, such that as soon as you have P, you have Q, you can't have P anywhere else, say here. Okay, now let's apply modus ponens. Premise one, P entails Q, which is the diagram, then you say P. So you assert P, you know, there's a dot that's found here. Well, as soon as you have P, you also know you, you have Q because that dot is also within the circle of Q, right? Cool. Okay, I'm gonna skip this because it's overkill. Here is the second inferential rule, modus tollens. It's Latin, that means the mode of argument that denies by denying. Modus tollens has the following structure. We also have our conditional as one of our premises, phi until psi. However, you say not psi. That is not the consequent. 
and then you can cl conclude not the antecedent. This one is slightly less intuitive than modus ponens, but I hope we can still see that it makes very good intuitive sense. Here's an example. Take a look down here. If the oven is on, then I am cooking. Let's say that's P entails Q. Then you say, I am not cooking. Not Q. Then you can conclude, not P. Right? You know if you turn the oven on, then you're cooking something. Now, for some reason, you know that you're not cooking. So therefore, the oven is not on. Of course, you can cook in some other way, say use your pot or a pan. That's fine. But here, notice that you're saying you're not cooking at all. But whenever you turn on the oven, you know that you're cooking. So if you know that you're not cooking, then you know that the oven is not on. Does everyone see that? Here's the form again. P entails Q. You say not Q. That is not the consequent. Therefore, not P. Okay. Somebody asked, does it mean that the oven is on only if I am cooking? Let me think about that. If you say the oven is on only if you're cooking, you mean as soon as the oven is on, then you're cooking. So it is the same. This is equivalent to saying uh, oven on only if cooking. Right? P, Q, and then here is saying P entails Q as well. Good. Okay, here's a visual representation of the same thing here. Remember, I'm going to demonstrate to you that modus tollens is valid. Premise one, P entails Q. Two, you say not Q. Okay, so when you say P entails Q, what you're saying is whenever you have P, you have Q, right? So if whenever you're here, you have Q. However, now you're saying not Q. So you're outside the circle. But if P is always inside the circle, then you can also conclude not P, which gives us the conclusion not P. Cool. Does that help? Do you guys find the visual representation is better for you? The same or worse? Okay. Everyone, everyone's minds works differently. I think a lot of people find the visual representation quite good. Um, for me, it doesn't really do anything for me. Okay, so here are some, um, here's another example, okay? Again, logic is often about examples. If Bob goes swimming, then Bob will be wet. Okay, now this seems quite plausible. Now, if Bob is not wet, right, then I conclude that he hasn't gone swimming. Now, of course, this doesn't say that the only way for Bob to be wet is if he goes swimming. You know, if somebody sprays a hose on him, then he'll be wet. But your second premise is precisely not the negation of the consequent. You know he's not wet. So you know that he hasn't gone swimming and you might know that uh, somebody didn't hose him down. Okay. Cool. So here's, here's an exercise for you. What inferential rule is being applied here? 
Type it out in the chat or just tell me. Yeah, it's Modus Tollens, MT. Well done. Okay. What about this one? Exercise E. What inferential rules being applied here? What's the inferential rule being applied here? It's all the also modus tollens. So I complicated this a bit. And I suppose it really depends on your symbolization scheme. I symbolized here, the card will not start as not Q, but you could have really done it Q. And if you'd done it Q, then premise two would be not Q. So then you get the classic canonical form P not Q, therefore not P, which is MT. However, I kind of misled you. I wrote this as not Q, which you might want to symbolize it that way. You know, there's no reason why you can't but then that will make P2 not not Q, which I hope you can see is also just the negation of the consequent. Not not Q is just not Q with an extra not. Okay, so this is also empty. Okay. Here's our last rule. Here's our last rule for today and also for term test one. It's called modus tollendo ponens. MTP. It means the mode of argument that asserts by denying. Okay, it has the following structure. Phi or psi, not psi. Therefore, phi. Think about this. If you say, I will have either the soup or the salad. And you don't have the soup, then you can infer that you'll have the salad. This is sometimes also called disjunctive syllogism. You don't need to know this name. Okay, but I think in maths, they often call it this. Okay. Here is the structure again. You say P or Q, not Q, therefore P. Remember, for the disjunctive, for the disjunction, there's only one way. Sorry, there's only one way in which it is false. That is, if both disjuncts are false. But if it's true, then you know that both of them could be true or just one of them is true. However, if you know that one of them is false, then you can't have it the case that both of them is true. And you also know that one of them is false. So that leaves you with only one alternative, that the other disjunct is true. Cool. So here's an example. James will travel to Macau by ferry or helicopter. All right. I guess you could drive now, but let's just say, you know, you can, let's just say the premise is true, that you can travel to Macau by ferry or helicopter. So he is not traveling by ferry, so not Q. Therefore, he must be traveling by helicopter. 
modus to lend opponents. That's our last inferential rule before the test. Okay. So here's our last exercise for the day. I'll change it up a bit. Use the following symbolization scheme to construct an argument that uses MTP, yeah? You can have as many premises as you want, but you can have only one conclusion. So here's the symbolization scheme. I'll give you, you know, 30 seconds. If you're done, maybe write me the answer. Say what P1 is, what P2 is, and what C is. You can get creative if you like. Okay, does anybody have anything for me? Ah, okay. The first one we got is indeed one of the more complex ones. Here, so P or Q or S, not Q. Um, actually, you, I think you made a mistake. Well, I, well, yeah, you did make a mistake. Maybe it was a typo, but it should be not Q or S. And then P. Of course, implicit in premise one are parentheses here. So, you know, this has the form phi and then psi, not psi, therefore phi. Okay. Uh, we've got plenty. Okay, here, I'll give you the simplest one. You know, we don't have to use all of, all of the symbols, right? So let's say, okay, look, you know, we walked into a murder scene and, you know, there were, you know, f um, four people in the house. Well, there was, there were four people in the house. There was the owner of the house, there was the gardener, the chauffeur, and the maid. Let's say that us, us as detectives, we concluded that the chauffeur was not the murderer. You know, the chauffeur was caught on camera, you know, uh, washing the car or something, right? At the time of the murder. So we know that, it's, you know, Q is out of the question. As detectives, we might assert, okay, either P or S, either the gardener was the murder or the maid was the murder. Then suppose we get new evidence, right? Um, I don't know. The maid was, uh, you know, had an alibi of some sort. So we say not S. And then we then conclude, okay, well, it must be the gardener. If it's not Q and it's not S, but we also know it must be P or S, then it's P. Modus tolendo ponens. Okay, thanks very much for your time. That was the last inferential rule. Um, Next time, we'll cover two formal fallacies and we'll do a bit of review. Please do the practice sheet one after today. You'll be able to do most of those questions, albeit not all of them. You won't be able to do the formal fallacy ones, but you should be able to make good progress on the rest. Um, good luck revising. And if you have any questions, feel free to stay behind. Have a good weekend.